That was kind of nice, wasn't it? That was kind of nice. Man, I don't know. It just it reminds me. It reminds me. You know, even when, most of the time when we have more of a, a corporate setting and a more corporate atmosphere and more corporate environment of worship, where we're all just engaged and, and energized, and, and then there's these moments where I, I just consider like personal moments of worship, or sometimes I just like to sit with my guitar and I just want to play and I just want to sing and just have my time. And I, and I appreciate Brian and Aubrey take us to that place where we can just have our time with God on a Sunday morning to get our hearts and our minds all focused in. Hey, if you're here with us for the very first time, I want to welcome to the lake. I'm Ronnie. I'm the pastor here, and we're so glad to have you here. If you got it, when you came in, they handed you a card. If you could just take a moment just to let us know that you're here with us. Fill it out, just a little information, as long as it's your name, and, and, and stop by. Stop by the Resource Center, and we have a gift for you. We have a special gift just to thank you, especially if you put your email on there or a mailing address and uh, uh, your credit card number and things like that. <laughs> now, just a little information that you're here with us, you're spending your morning with us because we're so excited. We value you being here. It's part of our, our series. This is for the second week of this series called Vision and Values. And it's what we choose to value as a church that make us who we are as a church. And last week as we started off, I shared with you a passage from the Old Testament that I had read a while back. And then a week before this series kicked off, I heard it on the radio, and it's like it was like confirmation. This verse is saying what I want us to hear. It's like a key verse for us through this whole series, and it's uh, Isaiah 43, verse 19. And what it says is for is God is talking to Isaiah and says, "For I'm about to do something new. I'm about to do something. Something is about to happen. I'm about to put something in motion. See, I've already begun." It's not like it's, it's a haphazard, just a last-second thought of God. He's, he's, a change is coming, something new. I have a plan for you. I have a vision. And I've already put it in motion. Do you not see it? Can you not recognize what I'm doing? And last week, as we started this series, we talked about core values in Lake Community Church and how people that participate, people that participate in what they see God doing, say, do you not see it? Well, yeah, we see what God is doing in the church. We see what God is doing in, in our lives. So we'll do all we can to participate, to be a contributor, to do. Contributors do. Participators do. And the scriptures say that God blesses those who do. They do what they hear. They do what they read. They, they respond and put into action the things that they know about God and what He wants to do in their life. Unlike consumers, consumers just listen to what God has to say. They might read, but they never apply it to their lives. And it's, it's not that God doesn't bless consumers, but He blesses the contributors. And the contributors, those who do, are following the example set by Jesus, who said, I didn't come to earth to be served by people. I came to serve. They also follow these people who do also follow the example of the early church that were not satisfied with just Sunday only with the disciples teaching and encouragement and guidance. They wanted to participate with that in their lives. They would share that with people. They would serve other people. They put it into serving. See, consumers want to be served, but contributors want to serve. Participate and serve. Those two words right there are two of our eight core values here at the lake, what we use to define who we are. We want to participate in what God is doing. We want to serve in what God's doing. And another, another core value is authenticity. It's authenticity. To be who we are. We know that we're not perfect people. And we're not going to pretend that we're perfect people. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you I know everything. And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I have all the answers. Because more than likely, if you ask me a question that's really hard, I'm going to tell you I don't know. But I'll be happy to sit down with you and talk and maybe we can find what God wants us to know. Maybe we can find what direction God is trying to lead us. I don't have all the answers and I don't want to come across that way because we know nobody's perfect. But we want to be authentic followers of Jesus and we value authenticity. Be who God has called us to be. Are there, are there any uh, collectors in the room? You collect like coins? Baseball cards, guitars, guns. All right, there we are. All right, okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to get a little, yeah, 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 yeah. What you got? Yeah. I got a daisy. All right. <laughs> pump action. Okay, yeah. The more you pump it, the further the DV goes. Uh, no, but, you know, to people, now, if I were to say the term certificate of authenticity, what does that mean? 
It's the real deal. It's, it's the real deal. Uh, a writer of a book about lifestyle evangelism, Joe Aldridge, he said this, that Christians are to be good news before they share the good news. That Christians, followers of Jesus, should be real. They should live out what they believe. They should be authentic in how they live. And we have a certificate of authenticity. This is, this is what I want to show for an example. I have a football, since it is football season, I have a football that's inflated to New England standards. Uh, <laughs> see, because I can, I can squeeze it. If I can squeeze it, then it's, this is supposed to pierce your chest, is what I've understood. But this is an NFL football, regulation football, uh, Dallas Cowboy football, uh, AFC, NFC, all this is on here. I, I don't care who you pull for. I'm just showing this is a football. It's just, it's just a football that's been signed. And it's, you know, I can put it in a, a case or I can tell you all about it. But I have also in this envelope a certificate of authenticity from the Dallas Cowboys. This one is signed by John Kitna and Tony Romo when they were both quarterbacks for the Cowboys several years ago. So this is like the real deal. This is not a, a Walmart. What's that name? I don't know what. No, 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 no. This is the real deal. Especially this John Kitna. He's got Jeremiah 15, 16 on there. It says that he devours God's word, that he eats up God's word, and it becomes a part of him, and he becomes authentic follower of Jesus, which I thought was really kind of cool. But this, this was a gift. But it's, see, he has a certificate of authenticity. So this is the real deal. And as followers, as believers, we, it's the same with us. When people meet us, and they meet us for the first time, and they want to talk to us, stay. And uh, when they see, do, do they see the real us? Do they see an authentic follower of Jesus? Or do they see someone who says they're a Christian? See, someone who says they're a Christian, they check that box or they're filling out an application that says religious affiliation, uh, Christian. They, 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 they don't really know. They pick that one because that's the, that's the biggest majority that people pick. They're, they're just consumers. They're, you know, they, just, they just show up. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're Sunday only. For one hour on Sunday, they're a Christian. But the rest of the week, the rest of their life, they don't really follow the, any guidelines. They just show up on Sunday, so I'm a Christian. That makes me a Christian. Or maybe they're a CEO Christian. They're a Christian. They're a Christmas Christian or an Easter Christian only. That's the only time you see people. When they, when they speak to us, do they, are they talking to somebody who says what they believe? They really live it out or they just go through the motions? Are they pretending? Or do they meet somebody who's real, that's authentic? that's a follower of Jesus and knows, knows Jesus and, and relates to Him and can, can share with Him. Are we, are we who we say we are? Are we real? And the Apostle Paul, he wrote, he wrote to, to Romans, he wrote them specifically about authenticity, being authentic in how we live our life and being authentic in how we live. And this is what he said in Romans chapter 12. He's writing this letter to believers who say they're believers. He's writing this letter. He says in Romans 12, starting in verse 9, don't just pretend to love others. Don't say, oh, I love everybody. I love everybody. Look at the world. No, we don't. Don't pretend. Don't pretend. Be real. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. He's saying participate and serve in what God is doing. Be real. Be authentic. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be real. Be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony, America, with each other. This is Paul writing us. Live harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people, non-believers. Associate with them. Welcome them. And don't think you know it all. I like that one. I was like, yes, amen. I don't know it all. Paul knows it. Paul knew this 2,000 years ago. And I wouldn't know it all. Great. See, all of this, all these verses, Paul is saying to believers, you need to be real. 
You need to be real. You need to be sincere. You need to be authentic in all that you do. And for us to be sincere, for us to be authentic, for us to be real, we need to know the real Jesus. The real Jesus. The one who did not pretend to love us. He gave his life for us. You can't pretend to do that. He gave everything for us. It, it's what we call the gospel. It's, who, it's what makes us who we are as followers of Jesus, knowing the truth that Jesus took all of my mistakes and all of my shortcomings, all of my failure, all of my sin, and he took that upon himself and they allowed him to nail him to a cross and punish him and kill him instead of us. He lay in a grave for three days because he loves us. Not that he pretended, but he loves us. And to prove God's love for us, God raised him back to life three days later. And if we believe that and accept God's love demonstrated through Jesus, we would be changed. We would become authentic followers of Jesus because now Jesus lives inside of us. And he is our certificate of authenticity. When people look at us, they need to see Jesus living through us. Just like the writer said. They need to be the good news before they share the good news. He's saying all of that for us to be real, to be authentic. But what, what, what does it mean to be authentic? What does it look like? Well, the first thing is this. Just be you. Just be who God created you to be. We were all created to be unique. We all have a unique design. Even Psalm 139, 14 tells us that we were all, each of us created fearfully, and we were each fearfully and wonderfully made. None of us are exactly alike. And my friends, that's a good thing. Think it, think it through. Can you imagine if everybody looked alike and acted alike, talked alike, if everybody in the country was from God's country, the South. Can you imagine how boring? Well, that wouldn't be boring. It'd be a lot of fun. But you know, can, see, we, we have a creative God. And I would think it will give us all his plans and all his patterns to have cookie cutter believers, to have cookie cutter disciples, cookie cutter Christians, and cookie cutter churches that all look alike and all act alike. I think it'll be boring to God because God is a God of variety. He's a God of diversity. In God's house, that's what makes God's house his house. That's what makes his church his church is variety and diversity. All different peoples together in one body doing something together for God. Because you never know. One day, maybe today, someone would walk through the doors here or walk into your life and the only thing they need is to connect with someone just like you. No one else will matter. No one else is important enough. And no one else is going to make an impact like you will. Because of the way God made you. When they look at you and they watch you, they see, they see the authenticity. They see who God has made you. And they see how God is working in and through your life. And it just might be enough to introduce them to Jesus. Just for you being yourself. So if we want to be authentic, we need to be ourselves. And number two, we need to be real on the inside. We need to be real on the inside. Not, not fake on the outside or fake on the inside, but to be real on the inside. This is, we need to have this authentic emotional life. And what's so difficult and what's so unfortunate is that many Christians try to hide. We try to hide in order to disguise our feelings. Because we've been taught growing up that Christians don't get mad. Christians don't get angry. They don't show anger. They don't fight with people. They don't argue with people. Christians don't do that. Y'all are supposed to be perfect. No, I'm authentic. We're supposed to keep our feelings to ourselves. If we express any kind of fear, if we express any kind of doubt, if we express any kind of hurt, then that shows that we have a lack of faith. That's what we've been taught growing up. Then we're, oh, well, you just have a, I'm scared. We just it's a lack of faith. No, I'm scared. No, it's a lack of faith. No, I'm scared. I'm trying to tell you, I'm scared. And what happens even, even if life is very difficult, we'll paint on the smile. I'm fine. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. We look like the Joker without the makeup. We just have this permanent smile on our face. 
I'm fine. The world is falling apart, but I'm fine. And no matter what happens in your life, don't let anybody see you cry. Don't let them see you cry. Christians don't cry. They're strong in their faith. Where do we get that? It's not in the Bible. Jesus didn't tell us that. Where did we come up with that, that we're, not, we're supposed to hide our feelings and emotions? And how did, how did, let me ask you this. If you're familiar with the Bible and the, the gospel, the gospels and all, how did Jesus respond when he walked into the temple and there were money changers in there? Can I have what? I thought I heard P.O. Yeah, he was. Yeah. <laughs> he made a whip and cleaned the place out. Read it. He didn't say, excuse me, could y'all leave? No. He threw them out. How did Jesus respond to the death of his friend Lazarus? He wept. He cried in public. He didn't walk off in the corners. <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah, I'm good. We're fine. Lazarus, come forward. Now he cried and people saw him and said, oh, look how much he loved. What do seekers need to see more than painted on smiles, pasted on smiles, cold hearts, and blind stares? They need to see real Christians, authentic believers who struggle. That we're human. That we hurt. That we have pain in our life. That we have fear in our life. Then we get angry. Then we have those moments of sadness. They need to know that we talk about it. We talk openly about our struggles. They need to be able to watch how our faith leads us through all the emotional trials of life. We need to be real. Just be you. Be real on the inside and admit your failures. Admit our failures. Because there's times, you know, I'm just being honest, there's times I fail. And I'm sure there's times that you fail. We make a mistake. We sin. We didn't mean to. They cut us off. They're driving like 10 miles an hour in a 55. They just pour out in front of us. And we're, you know, and the hand goes up and we don't know where that came from. We're blowing on the horn. What happened? I didn't know it was that loud. And we're right on their tail. You know, it's just things like this. We know we made a mistake. But our culture has convinced us to not tell anybody, to not own up to it, to blame somebody else. It's their fault they pulled out in front of us, not our fault that we weren't watching far enough up ahead that we could adjust our speed. It's their fault. We blame somebody else. We try to rationalize our mistake. Well, it wasn't that big a deal. Or we hire a really good lawyer to get us off. See, for some reason nowadays, nobody owns up to their mistakes. They push it off on somebody else. And that's not God's plan. It never was God's plan. But he actually called us and challenged us to the, do the opposite. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, if we own our mistakes, we admit our failures. And then over in James it says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray to one another. Be authentic. Talk to somebody. Let them see what's going on with it, that you may be healed. When you're authentic and you share your failures and you admit your failures, God works in your life. Authentic confession, admitting our failures and taking responsibility for our actions and ownership for our mistakes is a powerful witness as a Christian to a non-believer. When we live with authenticity, others will see the real Jesus in and through us. And finally, live like we want it, or like we mean it. Live like we mean it. Be bold. Take a stand for what we believe in. Don't just cower away and, and just sort of be shy about it. Be bold about it. it. I don't know about you, but it strikes a chord deep down inside of me when I see someone take a stand. When they stand up for what they believe in against all odds, they don't stand really a chance, but they still, they're convicted and they, they're committed to their, what they believe in. I think about 1989, you see this Chinese, Chinese college student standing in front and stopping a tank, a tank in Tiananmen Square. 
the picture is burned in my mind. I can see it today. In this holy hand, stop. This past Monday, 9-11, we set aside moments to remember firemen and policemen who ran into the World Trade Center towers, rushed in as people were rushing out. They have a conviction. They have a commitment. They're bold and they stand for the truth. And there's people who are looking for somebody. They're looking for anybody to stand up and proclaim the truth and then live it boldly. If you're going to say you believe in Jesus Christ, you go to church, you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, stand up. I want to see it on Tuesday. I want to see it on Friday night. I want to see it at the ball game. I want to see it uptown. I want to see what you believe. With no compromise. As believers, we've got to live what we believe. We've got to own it. We got to, this, is what we, this is what we say. So when, I'm, when I'm talking about this, about being authentic, I'm, I'm asking myself, am, all right, am, am I authentic? When people look at me and people talk to me, do they hear the real me? And am I ashamed of the real me? Because they don't see who I want them to see. I mean, I want them to see Jesus. So do I allow them to see my emotions? Do I allow them to experience what I'm going to do? Do I share with them what I'm going to do? Let them know that I'm a real person. I'm not up on a pedestal. I don't know God any better than anybody else. I just know there's a God and I love him and he gave his son for me. I know that him is the real Jesus and I want that in my life. Am I living what I say I believe? Do people, when I have a conversation with somebody, am I, am I being the good news before I have to share the good news? It takes me back to Isaiah. Well, I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. I chose you. It's in the works. It's in your life right now. I'm calling you to be authentic. I'm calling you to participate. I'm calling you to serve. I'm calling you to be the church I wanted you to be. I've already put it in motion. Just, just look back. Just, don't you see it? Don't you see how I've done this? Let's pray. God, I do thank you for, for the way you challenge us when we open your word. I mean, in, in, in this series, we're just we're learning about what you place value on. And, and we've already learned that you place value on those who participate in what, what you tell us. We, we take part in it. We serve others. Is it possible we could fake it? Participating? Is that just to get attention? Are we serving somebody just to get something back? Are we being really authentic? It really doesn't matter. I mean, Paul, Paul tells us just to serve people. Paul tells us to love everybody, to hate wrong. Sometimes, you know, I mess up and I do wrong. Do I try to hide that? Today, God, I want to... I want to thank you for making me the way that you made me. I'm unique. Somewhere there's somebody watching. And they're watching me. I'm the only person they're paying attention to because there's something about me. There's something that connects us. And when they watch me, do, do, they, do they see me as a follower of Jesus? Living out what I say I believe. Being real. Being honest. Being who you made me to be. Or am I trying to be somebody else? Somebody I wasn't called to be. Somebody you never intended me to be. Or you're about to do something new in my life, God. And I've been looking back and I've seen. It's already begun. Help me now. To be authentic. For you. To focus on you love for me, your son sacrificed for me. To know that there's no pretense. This is you and me, God. You've designed me for this day, for this moment, for this time to be authentic follower. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all can sit back down. I, it's in those, I think it's in those authentic moments of worship.
those authentic moments where it's us singing to God that it's everything within me is to know you and that all I want is to know you and to be authentic in our relationship with God and that authenticity is us participating in what we, what we see God doing and serving others. Uh, Friday night, uh, our students, our students, uh, our students, Pastor Eric, uh, they were at Easter Wind, they did a tailgate event where they were participating in serving other people, they in such a way they gave away 175 hot dogs, 200 200 bottles of water. I knew that. It's a lot of food they just gave away. I think they did great. I think they represented the church and what God calls the church. And then they have a thousand cheese puffs left. Uh, if anybody likes cheese puffs, fine. Eric, is that right? I got one hand here to take all of them, okay? <laughs> Just back the pickup around there, and uh, we'll dump them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool. I was out of town, but I checked, and I said, how'd it go? I said, oh, hey, we're getting around like 175 hot dogs, and, 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 and then people were, well, free? Yeah, free. You're, why? It's free. This is just who we are. And, and, we, we just, and I can't wait for the next one. It's, it, uh, now that the word's out there, there'll be a line. There'll be a line. I can see it. We're, we're going to be like those food trucks. We're going to set up at a different park. We'll pick another place. We'll have to text them and say, we're on the other side of the school. And uh, let's see if they come over there. But it, it's fun to watch students participate in what they see God doing. And it's really, it's really you should, sometimes you should take a moment and just talk to Eric and say, what, what's some of these ideas that the kids come up with? Because I'm thinking, they just want to play games. No, they want to establish uh, an organization at school. Or they want to uh, put one here. They want one there. They want, they want to see teaching and learning about God. They want to participate. They want to serve others. See, those are descriptors. Those are descriptors of what it means to be authentic. When you keep it to yourself, you're not really being authentic. It's when you share it with other people in the way that you do things. Whether it's a hot dog wrapped up in foil, I don't care. You're actually being what the church is called to be. You're reaching out to others. You're getting, you let people know that you're there and you care about them. And, it, and it's, there's so many things that can describe what we are as authentic. And one of my favorites, one of my favorite ways of describing what an authentic believer is, is, is the way we worship. It's how we worship. How we give our all to worshiping. That's just like, it's, it's, it's one of our core values. We really place value on worshiping. I mean, today we place value on this intimate times of worship. Most of the time it's a corporate. It's a celebration and cheering and shouting and clapping and dancing. If you ever walk back in the corner and watch me, I'm usually spinning around in circles and just having a blast. But you can look, it's fine. I, I won't be embarrassed. You might be, what in the world is he doing about it? I'm getting ready. I mean, you know, because worship is preparing us for something to happen. It has to be authentic. Worship, it, it means that we place value on this. And, and, and you can look in the Bible. The Bible places value on worship. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see examples of worshipers. It shares with us examples of what worshipers, what their life was like and how they worship God. It gives us uh, styles of worship, ways to worship. There's singing, there's dancing, there's shouting, there's kneeling, there's bowing, there's praying. There's every, everything you can think of that could be worship. Even giving is worship. Participating is worship. Serving is worship. There's all these examples. And sometimes we run out of words for worship. The Bible even gives us words to just express what it means to worship God. Some in Hebrew, some in Greek. It gives us all these words for us to know how to worship God. And if I would take everything that the Bible teaches about worship, if you read all through the Bible, get all the concordances and get it all lined up and put it on paper or on the computer and take a couple hundred pages, and then every commentary that's ever been written about worship and every devotional that's ever been written about worship and every book by an author that's focused on worship, A.W. Tozer, and you go through all these people and all about worship and Chris Tomlin and worship, Worship leaders in their books about worship. That if I took all of that, all that information, this vast amount of information, and if I could reduce it all down to one word, just one word, it's response. It's our response. See, when we worship, we will respond to God passionately. We'll respond to God authentically. With authenticity, we'll be authentic in our worship. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. With everything we are, that all that God has created, every area of our life, every sense of the five senses should be worship. Every characteristic, every moment in our life should be worship. It should be a response to who God is. We should be worship to a creator. 
We should worship our Savior. We should worship a Father who has an unending, unconditional love. We should wor worship our provider. We should worship our comforter. We should worship our King. We should worship our Lord. We must worship them for who He is and what He's done. We look at our lives, our individual lives, how God has worked in our lives. We worship Him and thank Him and praise Him for that. We look at the church and what God is doing in the church. We worship and praise Him for that. It should be a response. Our worship is a response to who God is and what He has done. This is what we're supposed to do. Our whole heart, the heart of worship is our heart. It's right there, just beating. Every beat should be a worship to God. This is who we are. Not, it's not limited. It's not restricted to just Sunday morning for an hour. It's not a specific song. It's not a specific style. It's not the presentation. It's not the lights. It's not the, the environment. It's none of that. It's a response. It comes from an authentic follower of Jesus. Many of you are probably familiar with a an encounter that Jesus had uh, in, in the book of John. He had a, it, most time it's Jesus and the woman at the well. It's a Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus comes in contact with. And the most of the time when we teach this, and most of the time when we share it and read about it, we focus on their conversation. That Jesus wants some water, and she would say, well, you know, this is a well and all this. And he said, well, if you would just ask me, I would give you living water, and you would never thirst again. And then he starts telling her about her past and about her present and all the struggles that she's ever had and all the struggles that she's going through. And she's so moved by his knowledge and who he is and who he says he is, she, she goes into town and tells everybody in town, you need to come out. She invites everybody out to, t out to meet Jesus at the well. But there was another conversation that they had as well. Who is this? conversation as well at the well they had this conversation about worship authentic worship not just what song do you like or what band you listen to what church do you go to well what authentic worship and this is this is how this is how it happens it's john chapter 4 and it starts at verse 19 and the woman is talking to jesus after he's been speaking to her and he says sir the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. I can see that you have a knowledge of God. I can see that you're pretty religious, that you know, that you have you have this relationship that you understand scriptures. I can see this. So let me ask you a question. You know how people are, oh, you're a pastor in a church? Let me ask you a question. Oh, you're you're a Christian? Let me ask you a question. Well, I see that you're a prophet. Let me ask you a question. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. We worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews, because you're a prophet, and I know you're a Jew, you claim that the place we must work and we went, we must worship is in Jerusalem. The Samaritans could not go to Jerusalem. They could not enter the temple because the Samaritans were half Jewish and half Gentiles. So that made them unclean. They could not enter into the temple, so they couldn't worship there. They were sinners. They were not welcome in the temple. Only the priest, only the best could be in the temple. So and, and since they're half Jew, they know that there's a God. They know that they're supposed to be worshiping God, but they can't go there. So they established their church on a mountain over here so that they can worship God. And this is how I interpret. This is how I see how things unfolded and how things were going to take place. This is just me. The Jews over here, First Baptist in Jerusalem... <laughs> They heard about Gentile community church over here. <laughs> they heard about it. And they heard that this church over here was growing. This church over here was rocking. They had some worship going on over there. And people were coming over there. And they were kind of just being stagnant over here. So they, they sort of mingling with people. And they could get the word out. They do that little gossip thing. They say, well, they're not really worshiping. Because they're over there. They're, they're, not, they're not in the temple that Solomon built for us. This is Solomon's. He built this. Unless you're worshiping in this building, you're not going to heaven. We got a steeple. Y'all look like a box. Yeah, we love our box. You know, y'all can say you worship there, but you're really not worshiping there because you're not singing the same songs that we sing the way we sing them. You're not reading out of the same Bible that we read. Unless you read out of this Bible, you're not getting into heaven. Because this is the one that Jesus carried with him with 40 days in the wilderness. <laughs> what? I'm just, you know, some of this is kind of ad-lib and crazy, but it happens. 
This is just my interpretation. Um, you know, this. Then Jesus cuts her off. In verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, you can take this to the bank. That's what he's saying. Ah, wait a minute, wait a minute. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in your box nor at First Baptist Jerusalem. I'm about to do something different. Worship is not a location. It's not limited to a location. It's not limited to Sunday morning. It's not limited to that building. It's not limited to that building. You can't restrict it to that building. That's the place you can worship. That's not what it is. It's a response. Heart. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. You only have part of the story. You know there's a God, but you don't know how much He truly loves you. What he's willing to do for you. You don't fully understand that yet. We, on the other hand, we worship what we do know. We know that God created us to be his chosen race. That God rescued us from Egypt. That God delivered us back into the promised land after we were taken into exile. We worship that God for who he is and what he's done for us. For salvation is from the Jews. And so often people read this and say, oh, that says salvation is for the Jews. No, it doesn't say that. That salvation for all people would begin over here in the Jewish church where Jesus was a preacher. Where he lived his life. Where he taught and shared the gospel by living the gospel and he's going to make that for all the people over here in this other church and all the Gentiles and all the people who are not welcome in the aforementioned church. This is just my interpretation of what's going on. And then this is where it really gets good. Because I've, I've read this and I've taught this and, and many times about Jesus and the woman to well, but I've missed this part till this week when I was getting ready for the day and it just jumped right off the page. I said, was that there the whole time? Yes, it was there the whole time because it's in the scriptures. John 4, starting at verse 23. Jesus is talking. You got to get your head around this because Jesus existed in the Old Testament as well, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that Jesus was God and that God was telling Isaiah in Isaiah 43, John 4, 23, yet a time is coming for I'm about to do something new. It has now come. See, I've already begun. I'm about to change the way people worship. And I've already started the process. It's already in motion. Do you not see it? Not yet, but you will. A time has now come when the true worshipers, those authentic, real followers, not, not the consumers, but the contributors, not the ones that are watching, but the ones that are participating, the ones that are serving others, they're seeing what God is doing. The true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they, the true worshipers, the authentic, the real, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers he, he, he even actually uses this lady's words. But she said, you know, we worship on his mountains, but you Jews say that we must worship. And Jesus says, God is spirit, and his, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying that worship is an authentic response. It's not a location. It's not limited to the case. It has, has nothing to do with a song. has nothing to do with the way the song is played. has nothing to do with the way the song is sang. has nothing to do with the setting. has nothing to do with the building. has nothing to do with that. It's all a response. You were created by God to be a unique individual, an authentic individual who worships God authentically. They give you all, your heart, soul, mind, and strength to worship God with all that you have. This is how we're supposed to worship. And we all have different ways of worshiping. Some, some worship like this. Some spin around, some jump, some dance, and some worship like this, and some worship like this. I understand. People bow, and people, but it just needs to be authentic. Have you ever seen the fake worshipers? Anybody watching? They're looking at who's watching them. They're not worshiping, they're putting on a show. I've seen real worshipers. And some of you stand there and, and you sob. Tears streaming down your cheeks. That's worship. Because you come, you're having a personal encounter with God. That's worship. It's authentic. It's unique. It's yours. Some of you are crushing the back of that chair. 
I'm surprised they've lasted as long as they had it. You're crushing that thing. Ugh. I just, I want to, I want to, I want to jump up on it. I don't know if it'll hold me or anything. Or maybe it's just, I can't, I can't, I can't let my arms get up because if I get up, I'll never get them back down. That's true. It's just worship. You know, we just got to be authentic and be real. And Jesus says it's authentic. You must worship. You have to worship. You have to worship in spirit and truth. Well, I don't know if I can worship in the spirit. Yes, you can. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus died for you and God raised him for the dead, his spirit lives in you. So you can worship in the spirit. It's right there in your heart. The heart of worship is the heart. It's right there. Well, I don't know if I can worship in truth. Yes, you can. Because as a follower of Jesus, an authentic follower of Jesus, you know the truth that God loves you. You worship in spirit and in truth. We must. Let's see, there's, there's no wrong way to worship God. But it's wrong not to worship God. And not to let it out. And holler once in a while. His little golf claps. That's out there. That's for the golf course. We need to be like those people that are saying, I'm obnoxious at the golf course. In the hole! We need to be like that, you know? We do that all the time. Yes! And cheer and amen and say it. Tell them, sing it. Oh, that's my soul. And just let it rip. This is God's house. It's not a cemetery. Of course, I've been allowed at cemeteries before, too. So. But we must worship. We must worship. People are watching us to see if we're real or fake. Lee Strobel, Case for Christ. Had that movie that came out, uh, had a book that's been out for years, Great Apologetics. His wife became a Christian before he did. And just to appease her, just to stop the nagging, just to get her off his back, he would go to church with her and sit there and look for phonies. Look for anybody, any hypocrite he could find. Anybody who is not real, just so he can reject the church, the whole idea that he can reject Christianity, this whole God that she's worshiping there. But what he found was authentic believers who loved him, who pray with him and welcome him. He began to change him. He thought, no, this can't be. He tried to disprove all of it his knowledge of investigating revealed the real Jesus. And Lee Strobel became a real, authentic follower of Jesus Christ. See, we never know who's watching us to see if they can pick us apart and reject our belief. Reject the church. Reject Christianity. Reject God's love. So it's up to us to be authentic in the way we live our life, to be who God has created us to be, to live like we mean it, to worship authentically with a heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because just maybe that person is watching, is looking for a glimmer of hope and a glimmer of truth and a glimmer of authenticity. And this Jesus, he must be real. Let's pray. God, as we live our lives, as followers, as we're just wanderers. We're really not sure exactly what, what we believe. We're really not sure about where we stand in our relationship with you. But we're hearing today that you, you have a plan for us. All the way back in Isaiah, and it's repeated again in the New Testament that you're starting to do something new. You've already started the process. And if I, if I accepted your free gift of salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection that it's already begun in me. I'm a part of this process. I'm a part of being authentic. I'm a part of participating. I'm a part of serving. I'm a part, I'm a part of worship. So God, as I live my life, as a follower of Jesus, then today, I take this as confirmation. I take this as encouragement. I take this as guidance. That I'm living the life that you've called me to be. Because I'm not putting on a show. I'm not, I'm not wearing a mask with a smile on it. People know how I feel. I'm, I'm real with them. Because I'm real with you. You know every hurt I have. You know every joy I celebrate. 
and it's not for me to keep to myself. It's to share. Because God, I just, I just want to sing. I want to dance. I want to read your word. I want to live as an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. I want to worship you with my, all my being. Hold nothing back. Allowing you, your truth and your spirit, to live in and through me. So that when people look at me, they see the gospel, the good news, before I share it. Maybe you don't know that, Jesus. It's just a heartbeat away. He's ready to do something new in you. Uh, if you just pay attention, he's already begun. Just got to see it. God, today as we pre present our gifts of worship, our offerings, our praise, it's an act of worship. This is authentic, God. It's not just something I'm putting in a basket. This is, this is real. This is the real deal. I, I have a certificate of authenticity. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to trust you, God. And this is, this is my gift. This is to say thank you for who you are, what you've done in my life. So would you use this offering, God, in, in, in your way? I, I, I have, there's no strings attached to this. This is my gift to grow your church. lifeboat, whatever people want to call it, but to be your church, God, to be the church that you want us to be, to live what you've called us to live. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.